Welcome back, Maniacs. Jamie here. And today, we're going to bring Season 2 of our Adventures Retrospective series to a close by taking a look at the biggest set from the jungle theme, 5986 Amazon Ancient Ruins. Released in 1999, it contains 458 pieces, 8 minifigures, and retailed for $80 in the US. Unfortunately, I don't have the original instructions for this set, but if you happen to find yourself in the same predicament, all of the jungle instructions can be found on the official LEGO website. I wanted this set the second I saw it 20 years ago, and actually just added it to the collection in the past few months. So let's dig in and see if it was worth the wait. Just like its older brother, Pharaoh's Forbidden Ruins, Amazon Ancient Ruins comes with not one, but two forms of transportation. This time, a car and a boat. So, let's check those out first. The car features a very Scorpion Tracker-esque design, making use of the two-passenger body element, hinged windshield, and specially molded grill piece. It also has the storage crate at the rear, which I felt was missing in the Spider's Secret car. But my favorite difference between this and the Tracker are these oversized tires mounted on the back wheels. These things really give the vehicle an aggressive look, and I love it. Some smaller details also present are the printed license plate up front, and of course all the necessities inside. Steering wheel, shifter, and console tile. And another cool inclusion are the fuel tanks below the cab. And it's worth mentioning that we've got a few surprising set-exclusive elements here. This 2x2 tan curved brick that makes up the hood, and the tan axle plates have never again been offered in any other set, at least as of 2019. Neither of these are mind-blowing pieces, but pretty rare nonetheless. I think this is a perfectly fine addition to the Adventurer's fleet, but what happens when roads turn to rivers? Luckily, we've got that covered here too. Even though the instructions direct you to give this little steamboat to the villains, you can obviously switch it up if you want to. The whole thing is built inside a single hull piece, which, molded in brown, is another exclusive to this set. When compared to the much more common boat piece, you'll notice that it's quite a bit larger. Unfortunately for me, the seller I purchased this set from actually gave me this hull piece instead of this one, so I had to replace it using BrickLink. Beginning at the rear, there's a red pennant flying, and then a few tools clipped on each side. A pickaxe and a hammer. Plenty of room here for a single minifig to stand at the helm, which features a steering wheel, printed console, and throttle lever. Just ahead of that is the windshield, making use of a single piece with two openings and no glass. And then we've got the steam engine, or at least a rough approximation of one. It uses some red tiles that I assume are meant to represent hot coals, a black curved brick for the top, and a small smokestack made up of four studs. Up front, there's more open space for the passengers to sit or stand. I mentioned in a previous episode that I enjoy LEGO Watercraft in general, and even though this is pretty small and simple, it's no exception. But enough of the small stuff, let's get to the reason I wanted this set so bad as a kid. And here it is. Keep in mind that this came out the same year as the very first LEGO Star Wars sets, which I was beyond blown away by at the time. So for something to stand out amidst the X-Wings, TIE Fighters, and speeder bikes, it must have been pretty special. Or at least it was to my adolescent eyes. Before we get to the nitty gritties, one of the most obvious things you'll notice is the fact that everything is built on this very large raised base plate. Measuring 32 by 48 in studs, it's set exclusive in this color scheme, and features some nice rock printing around the bottom of these two raised sections, and a river running straight through the center. Love them or hate them, without it, this set would be way smaller in terms of overall mass. In most cases, I personally don't mind raised base plates, but here, for some reason, I do feel like it's a bit of a crutch, used primarily to mask the relatively low piece count for such an expensive set. Don't forget that this came out 20 years ago, and adjusted for inflation, that original MSRP of $80 is roughly equivalent to $120 today. I can only imagine the uproar if LEGO released a 450 piece set at that price point these days. But anyway, let's begin our tour by checking in on our hero's campsite. Here we'll find a prickly bush next to a small rock formation, 
as well as a campfire and yet another set exclusive piece, this dark gray cooking pot. It's kind of hard to believe this never got released in any other set. Miss Gail Storm's camera is also here, ready to film all the action, and of course, it's loaded with the printed film tile we've seen several times before. Despite its simplicity, I like the stand, which lets you rotate the camera 360 degrees, and you can move the whole thing around wherever you see fit. One of Johnny's least favorite creatures is scurrying across the ground here, and this whole area is set up in the shade of a single palm tree, the same type we saw in the River Expedition episode. I still like the classic, posable design better, but you can't say this one doesn't look nice. Unfortunately, once again, the seller substituted the correct pieces with not-so-correct ones. Instead of having four separate leaves here, this should be all one piece, like this example. I just haven't got around to replacing them yet. That's it for the campsite, but if we jump over here to the right, we'll find the first bit of jungle ruins to explore. This reminds me a lot of the small build that came in the Ruler of the Jungle set, although it's a bit larger and features a pretty neat play function. The idea is that one of your minifigures, preferably a bad guy like Senor Palomar here, steps up and tries to steal the ruby, but right before he grabs it, the ground falls away and he tumbles into this pit below. And that's good news for whoever comes along next, because the statue was hiding a valuable secret inside. Four gold coins. As I've stated many times before, booby traps are one of my favorite play features, and this one is activated by simply pulling the pin out in the back. And this pit is also a great place to throw a spare skeleton fig if you've got one. Moving on, if we turn our attention front and center, we'll find this rope bridge spanning the chasm, the entrance of which is flanked by two ominous looking skulls. Just for fun, I counted up all the human remains you get when collecting the entire jungle sub-theme, and it comes out to seven skulls and four skeletons, so a chew has definitely been a busy guy. Anyway, you've probably noticed this yellow one by one round brick here, and that activates yet another trap. If we have Palomar begin to cross the bridge, just before he gets to the other side we can pull the pin and the whole thing drops out from beneath his feet and into the river below. This might not seem so terrible at first, but just like the Temple of Doom scene this reminds me so much of, there are some hungry jaws waiting in the water. This is fun to mess around with, but I think it would have been much more effective if everything was a lot higher off the ground, since most of the time the minifig doesn't even fall off the bridge. As for the croc, he's of the old style classic variety, and features an articulated jaw and tail. I still like these guys, although the newer mold used today is definitely more realistic. But let's pretend Achu is busy littering the jungle with skeletons and Palomar actually gets across the bridge. The first thing that'll greet him is this large spider web and spider. But these are easily brushed aside, or up rather, thanks to a pair of bar bricks here. And now we're finally inside Achu's Amazon ruins. Right away, we'll see that house cleaning isn't a top priority of his since he just leaves his toys laying around, and a pair of snakes have moved in. But he does have some decent decorating skills. On either side, we'll find this cool printed brick, identical to the ones we saw in Spider's Secret. And all along the top, we've got more prints, these being exclusive to this set. They each feature the same deco, with some stone carving details and vines creeping in on each side. But back to the ground. Palomar takes a few steps inside, and ah! Well, that's one way to welcome a guest. This is a pretty gruesome scene, especially by LEGO standards, but it's certainly effective. And the way it's achieved is pretty interesting. Jumping up here, we'll find this lance element sticking out, and at the rear, there's a modified plate piece on a hinge that just rests against the chain links. Release it, and the skeleton goes down. This is probably my favorite part of the set, and one I don't think I'll ever get tired of playing with. But Senor Palomar doesn't seem like the easily terrified, squeamish type, so let's follow as he continues his exploration of the temple. On the left, we have this small alcove, home to a torchlit ruby. And on the right is a completely identical build, but choosing to steal the ruby from this side has consequences. This should look familiar by now, and if we pull it, a pair of razor-sharp spears shoot down and impale the hapless treasure hunter. This is achieved with the help of a trapdoor piece up top, 
where we'll also find a leafy plant and some nice little stone embellishments repeated across the front of the ruins. And one more exclusive element, this large printed panel, makes up the center of the temple. I really appreciate the fact that there aren't any stickers to be found in this set. The details here include more vines, some stonework, and a very Aztec looking design in the center. And normally, this is all partially obscured by a green vine with sword leaves, which I love the look of. Continuing to the left, we've got what appears to be a Chu's chill out spot, although I'm skeptical he ever takes time out of his skeleton making to actually chill out. Regardless, here we'll find a small table with a goblet and another ruby, this one sitting atop a trans clear round brick. I'm not sure if this is meant to be just a ruby or perhaps some schnapps he confiscated from an unlucky jungle explorer. I like that idea better, so that's what I'm going with. The only other thing to see here is his feathered spear clipped to the wall. And notice the fact that there aren't any stairs or ladders leading up here, so apparently the sun disk gives its possessor the power of flight. And if the location of a Chu's throne is an indication, that theory might not be too far off base. From this majestic perch, one can oversee the jungle happenings below, meeting out disaster and destruction to all who dare trespass on this sacred ground. Or you could just hang out with this bat here. Due to his regal cape getting in the way, Achu can't actually sit here very well, so he's forced to stand on his throne, dangerously close to these torches, I might add. And here's the reason no one can seem to find the one true sun disc. He just keeps it on his person all the time. I would have expected to find a special place here to display it, but I guess that's a modification I'll have to add later. Besides the all-powerful sun disc, Achu is also given a gleaming silver knife. And the rest of the minifigures, who I'll just run through quickly since we've seen them all before in this series, also get their fair share of accessories. Gabaros is back, this time joining forces with the bad guys. But it seems he's sticking to his mantra of coffee first. His boss, now that he's been fished out of the river, clutches a pair of binoculars and a revolver. And the first of our heroes, Miss Gail Storm, is given a cutlass and a rifle, in addition to her film camera back at the campsite. Doc Lightning gets his trusty backpack, magnifying glass, and a pickaxe. And finally, my favorite, Johnny Thunder. The leader of the adventurers, he's carrying a map of the jungle and a chrome silver knife. Will they be enough to lead him safely through a Chu's deadly temple and finally claim the sun disk? Or will the ruler of the jungle add another skeleton to his collection? Of course, that's for you, the Lego maniac, to decide. They say first impressions are everything. And I gotta be honest with you guys, the first time I built this set, I was a bit underwhelmed. Perhaps it was the two decades I'd spent building it up in my head, but as I placed the final brick, I just couldn't shake the feeling that this set was overpriced and underpieced. And to some extent, I still kind of feel that way. But before you click that thumbs down, let me clarify. I don't actually dislike this set at all. On the contrary, I think it has some awesome features and a lot of interesting parts, and it definitely embodies that classic LEGO aesthetic. In the beginning, it just wasn't quite the amazing build experience I'd expected. But now that I've spent some time with it, any initial buyer's remorse I had in the beginning has long passed. Today, I'm quite happy to have it on my LEGO shelf, and certainly wouldn't consider my adventurer's collection complete without it. That said, if I had to choose between this and its predecessor, Pharaoh's Forbidden Ruins, it wouldn't be a tough choice for me. This is a great set, but I think it could be better. And one way to do that is to add more jungle. This once again proves my theory that just about any set can be improved with more palm trees. But really, I guess my only gripe with this set is the cost for what you get. And I think the same would have been true way back when it was released. Despite that, I still consider this a worthy addition to the adventurer's theme. But if you're thinking about adding it to your collection, I'd recommend you exercise some patience and wait for a good deal. According to Brickset.com, the average going rate for a used set is about $180, and that's about twice what I think it's actually worth. I picked mine up on eBay for $100, which was still way more than I really wanted to pay. I'm sure I could have found a better deal if I hadn't been in such a rush to finally get my hands on it. 
But that's all for the Amazon. It's by far the smallest sub-theme of adventures, which is unfortunate because the premise was pretty fantastic. Hopefully someday LEGO will revisit Johnny and the gang, and maybe then we'll see some more awesome jungle sets. Only time will tell. One thing's for sure though, we will be revisiting our heroes in Season 3 of the Adventurers Retrospective, where we'll catch up with them on the mysterious Dino Island. In the meantime though, we're going to check back in with our pirate friends for a few episodes, and then I've got something pretty out of this world coming your way that I can't wait to share with you guys. So be sure to subscribe if you haven't already. But until next time, this has been Jamie for Trick Bricks. As always, thanks for watching, take care, and play well!